All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, coming to this session. This is um, a talk that's going to be about uh, accelerating developer adoption of Cloud Foundry. And um, I'm joined today by uh, Luis Amadeo with Ultimate Software. He's a distinguished architect with Ultimate, and um, uh, he has some uh, uh, great insights to share about their adoption of Cloud Foundry. And uh, my name is Matt Gunter. I'm a platform architect with Pivotal. And uh, I work with a number of customers that um, are at different stages in adopting Cloud Foundry. And one of the things that captured my attention recently is what are the, the factors that help some companies kind of you know, press the gas and just take off with their adoption? And then what helps other, or what causes other companies um, to basically tap the brakes, right? And not be able to get past certain issues and so forth. So um, I did a, uh, a white paper on value stream mapping that talked about how Cloud Foundry adds value. And this talk kind of builds on top of that, which is why does it matter, who cares about it, and how to make that process go faster. So um, without any more intro, I'll just jump in here. So we're going to talk about two perspectives here, the developer's perspective of Cloud Foundry and what it means to them, as well as the stakeholder's perspective and how Cloud Foundry helps them accomplish their goals and mission. <clears throat> we're going to talk about things such as top-down versus bottom-up. Um, we're going to talk about trust and confidence and alignment and consistency. These are all things that end up kind of getting discussed in the context of culture. And um, you know, we're going to try to demystify that a little bit in this talk. And um, as I go through here, I've done some research on um, a number of Cloud Foundry adopters. And we're going to analyze their adoption of Cloud Foundry um, and try to understand why they're doing so well, why they might be having some challenges, and then what are some things that we could do to make it go better. So it's pretty clear. Um, most developers want speed and autonomy. Um, that's not um, you know, uh, very hard to realize. but. Uh, even so, even though we can offer all of these capabilities to developers with the platform, there's still resistance. And um, it's interesting to try to understand that resistance. And one thought about this slide that I, I chose the you know, Millennium Falcon as an example. Um, you know, if you tried to get, get Han Solo to trade in the Millennium Falcon, you might have a little bit of a trouble doing that, right? Um, you know, he's got a lot of history with it, him and Chewy you know, have a lot of shared understanding about the Millennium Falcon. So if you're going to get him to switch ships, um, it might be a little bit of a challenge. Now let's talk about stakeholders. The stakeholders are interested in um, outcomes, and they usually tend to um, translate those outcomes into a mission, right? And that's, uh, it's important to separate what the outcomes you're shooting for versus what the mission is. Um, for example, um, the graphic on the right, you know, a mission to Mars is not a mission to Mars. You can go into orbit, you can do a flyby, you can land a rover. There's a lot of details about the mission that are important to understand, to really understand what's going on there. And um, with uh, Cloud Foundry, the, um, a lot of times the outcome of developer productivity, operational efficiency, um, et cetera, those become the mission. And uh, we're going to talk a, a little bit more about that as we go through this to try to find a higher level mission, something more inspirational, something more compelling to uh, align Cloud Foundry with. And this, I believe, is, a, is one of the keys to um, companies adopting Cloud Foundry in a very successful way. Here's a, a basic model that I think a lot of Cloud Foundry adopters have in their mind when they look at accelerating adoption or you know, accomplishing their outcomes, they see, OK, I'm going to get Cloud Foundry installed, and then I've got to work with the devs to use it, and then I'm going to accomplish my outcomes, you know, almost like a math equation. Um, and we, uh, um, at Pivotal, we have quite a bit of support for companies, even with this mindset, to help them be successful. You know, we help their developers with 
uh, learning XP and installing the platform and managing the platform as a product, um, you know, helping them be more customer focused as a platform team to the developers so that they're listening to the developer, um, listening to the developer needs and trying to anticipate those, et cetera. But even so, with all of this, there are still challenges that emerge. So what I, um, in looking at this and trying to figure out what the best way to look at it, I came up with this Denison model. This is a, a, an organizational change model that was developed by Daniel Denison at University of Michigan, like, I don't know, in the 80s or something like that. It's been around quite some time. Um, but it's based on research that shows that all of these different dimensions in this model are related to company performance in a very concrete way, in a very measurable way. So basically what um, this model says is that if you're a company and uh, you have um, strong traits of mission, strong traits of adaptability, involvement, and consistency, you're going to have better um, you know, uh, better profit, better growth, et cetera. And um, these are all the same factors that I believe affect Cloud Foundry adoption. And if, Cloud, if we believe Cloud Foundry is gonna be a positive impact on your business, then this is sort of just upstream of that, this, this notion. So um, here are the things that we're shooting for in this model, right? A clear mission, technical consistency in the systems inside your company, involvement at all levels, and adaptability that's meaningful to your customers or your market. And you know, a lot of times we, you know, and I, I kind of did this with the value stream, what you kind of drill down into uh, the process and break out the magnifying glass and you say, hey, what's going on at this level or that level? But sometimes taking a broader perspective is more helpful. So I threw this Dolly uh, painting in that uh, thought kind of exemplified that. Now, um, if we take that Denison model and we um, apply it to Cloud Foundry, um, it kind of looks like this. So we have, instead of mission, let's just say long-term direction. Instead of consistency, let's say technical strategy. Um, instead of um, involvement, let's just say empowered teams. And then we have growth and adaptability. And, um, you know, all of these... Um, points that are inside these columns, these are nothing, there's nothing new here. These are the same things that we would be talking about in the basic model, right? We'll be talking about, you know, let's, do, um, let's manage Cloud Foundry as a product, so platform as product. Let's, you know, move towards microservices so we can reduce our development batch size and uh, reduce, you know, the, the sizes of our releases so we can release more frequently. Um, let's reduce technical debt. Let's, you know, adopt some agile practices. Um, you know, maybe do some cross-functional teams so that the teams don't have to reach outside of themselves to make decisions. They can be more autonomous. And then if you do all of these things, you're able to support experimentation, uh, learning, et cetera, on the business side. Okay, so let's, let's look at how that would work in a little bit more detail. So, there's a relationship. If, if things are working the way they're supposed to, and there's a lot of backwards and you know, back and forth in this model, you can start you know, with the growth and adaptability and learn something, right? That's what learning is. And that can feed back all the way to your mission. So that's a possibility. But you know, let's just start on the left side and say you have a mission to accomplish something for your customers um, or in your market. Um, you design a technical strategy to implement that. Um, maybe that includes Cloud Foundry. You um, want to empower your teams to take advantage of that technical capability and help achieve that mission. And uh, hopefully they, they make you know, applications and technology that's available to your customers and to your salespeople and to other people in the customer facing side of your business in order to achieve the mission, right? So that's the idea here. And if you're successful, there's a strong feedback loop that happens from the adaptability and growth pillar back to the mission pillar, and it reinforces that mission. And this is important to make sure that executives stay on board, that the uh, organization feels like they're making progress, removes frustration, et cetera, from, from things. So it just clarifies exactly what the company is trying to do. Now, if we look on the bottom side of the, um, 
of the Denison model, this is focused on internal uh, systems and people. So this is really the, the interplay between the technical strategy and the empowered teams that, um, you know, um, are your developers to a large extent here, but, you know, obviously your platform team and, you know, other people in the enterprise should also be empowered. But um, what this is really focused on is the fact that if your platform team just throws Cloud Foundry out there and they're not looking at how developers are using it, they're not listening for ways to improve the platform, they're not engaging with the developers to, you know, solve their problems, then there's not going to be a good feedback loop. And this inner loop is going to not be reinforcing. It's going to, you know, cause problems and it's going to limit your growth of, of Cloud Foundry. So let's take a look at a um, very positive example here. This is a retailer that has done amazing things with Cloud Foundry. Um, it's affected, you know, all of corners of their company and they've, um, you know, they basically want to be on par with Amazon. They want to be leading edge. It's a very bold, daring vision for them. Um, they're going so far with their technical strategy that they want to rewrite their core apps. Um, their teams are uh, wanting to adopt XP, so not just Agile, but you know, go all the way to pair programming and TDD and some of these more you know, uh, less common practices. Um, they're even promoting accountability to the point of giving devs access to production, the ability to release code into production. So that's also a very uh, bold thing for them to do. And all of these bold steps add up to um, a lot of growth and adaptability improvements. So they're revisiting all of the decisions and, and uh, practices that they've done in the past and making sure they fit with this new model. And the business is really feeling those benefits. And both of these inner loops and the outer loop are very much reinforcing in this scenario, right? And they're doing... Um, they're making great progress with the platform. Um, so let's take a look at um, a manufacturer that's um, more cautious. They have a process improvement mindset, and they're trying to um, uh, implement Cloud Foundry as an incremental improvement, build on success, enable the business. Um, their technical strategy is also influenced by this mission, so they're trying to prove the tech incrementally. And uh, they believe they, you know, from their perspective, they, they stood up Cloud Foundry very quickly. However, um, it took them 80 days to do that, which sounds a little bit on the, on the long side to me. And uh, after it was done, they had to certify it, et cetera. So that was, um, you know, those are all kind of telltale signs that they are, um, you know, being more cautious and they're still taking, you know, they haven't changed their practices, very, you know, to a large extent. Um, now, on the Empowered Team side, they are making strong progress in their digital factory model. Um, but basically, you might have heard this concept before. There's a, this uh, common uh, pattern of creating a center of excellence around Cloud Foundry and Agile development. And in a lot of large organizations, you kind of start with that COE and try to uh, expand across your um, dev population from there. So outside of that, there's still some complacency. They're looking for more change agents inside of uh, their dev teams to foster more adoption of Cloud Foundry. And um, so, that, so the feedback loop could be better on the inner cycle there. However, on the growth and adaptability side, they've, had, uh, they've done enough to have some impact on sales. Um, executive support is growing, so they are getting um, a little bit more uh, high, you know, executive level support. And so, you know, if I'm looking at this objectively, I f it seems like they need to really leverage that executive support to help um, transform more in the technical strategy and in the empowering teams to make sure that that doesn't stall. So the progress that they've made continues. Let's look at the flip side. So this is a... Um, uh, a company uh, that does the, uh, manages prescriptions and prescription drug programs, and they have a very they have the flip side problem, right? So they are very strong on the inner circle, uh, the inner loop. So they're they're um, doing they're automating everything with their platform. Their dev teams are doing a lot of training, a lot of app transformation. Um, there's a strong feedback loop there, and it's very reinforcing for them. So that's a very strong 
part of their um, transformation, but they're having trouble getting the business to know what to do with this capability that they've built, and they're get, having trouble with the executives knowing um, how to help them uh, get that engagement and that involvement with the business. So in this case, they, you know, I think on the flip side, they need to also get more executive sponsorship and get more help with the business to leverage what they're doing on the tech side. So um, again, you can see how this model is helpful in understanding you know, what you're doing well and where you might need to, to improve. And one thing that that Denison model is pretty good at is it points out ways that you can use one strength of the enterprise to help um, counterbalance weaknesses in other areas. So um, uh, here's another kind of perspective that I think is helpful too. This is an idealized adoption scenario. Um, and uh, you know, ideally you'd have the persistent mission from the beginning, right? You'd have executive sponsorship from the beginning. You'd build capabilities based on that. You'd, build, you'd grow confidence in the new practices um, following on those capabilities. And then you'd get some early wins and you would you know, start to pick up momentum. That doesn't always happen. A lot of times uh, the dev teams start using agile practices before the platform shows up or the mission comes later. I have some examples about that as well. And um, so here's, a, here's a, uh, a global bank that is basically having to refocus their inner loop because they delegated Cloud Foundry to a shared ops team that w was not able to support their developers as well. They were let, letting the platform not be upgraded as frequently as it needed to be and so forth. So they're bringing that back um, into the business unit. Um, in this other scenario, um, a financial services provider had a bottom-up scenario where the developers brought in Cloud Foundry themselves. They handed over to the ops team. Now the ops team, they're treating it just like any other piece of infrastructure. They're not managing it as a platform. But luckily, the devs have been able to rewrite a core application that's made an impact to the business, and it's starting to get the executives aware that there's something big going on with the platform and with this capability. So they have an opportunity here to get that outer loop to support some, some improvements of the inner loop and uh, in, you know, get, have their adoption uh, accelerate that way. So um, you know, a key takeaway here, I think, is that you know, the cultural aspects, this reinforcement that happens uh, around success or failure or what have you. Um, a lot of those um, boil down to beliefs and fears and things that have happened over years inside of your organization. And if nothing else, hopefully this model will allow you to kind of bring some of those factors up and be able to talk about them explicitly and not just have decisions being made about things based on you know, beliefs, fears, policies, habits, et cetera, that um, you know, don't move you forward in terms of your technical strategy or the way you're working with the technology. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip ahead so that um, Luis can tell uh, the story of Ultimate and their journey of adoption with Cloud Foundry. So Luis, come on up and um, I'll um, turn it over. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, so Ultimate Software. Um, so what do we do at Ultimate Software? So Ultimate Software, uh, software builds software, uh, human capital management software. So this is basically, uh, we have a product that's called Ultipro that enables organizations and employees to, to manage the complex life cycle from recruiting someone into the organization, onboarding people into the organization, and then living in that organization, getting paid, uh, getting perform performance reviews, setting your goals, all the way to retirement. So Ultimate Software, the mission has been very strong and consistent for the 28 years that we've been in business. And the mission uh, has actually driven, or the culture of the company has actually driven its mission, and it's basically to put people first. 
not only to put people first as the employees of the organization, because we strongly believe if the employees are empowered and we, we treat people first and put them first, they're going to take care of the business and is eventually the customers will be happy. Right? But also that culture and that mission translates into our product mission, which is simplify people's lives. So that is our customers' lives through our product, as well as our employees who are actually servicing our customers. Right? So um, as you can see in that red graph, in the journey to the cloud, um, that mission has actually stayed pretty consistent. Right? Now, that mission has led into many, drive many capabilities that we've actually driven, we've actually created in the cloud. Starting in the late 90s, we moved to a software as a service model. That was a big transformational shift. Um, after we moved to the SaaS model, we realized that obviously you need a lot of automation to be able to live in a SaaS model, especially driven by quality. Once you actually start delivering software in a SaaS model and you're actually trying to do it fast, then the first thing that we did, we need a lot of automation and actually test automation, ensuring that the product is, is actually a quality product. After we went through that, um, then we realized that we actually wanted to, con to deliver more, more value, right? So what happened was that the, cap the clock capabilities allowed us to actually test and ensure quality, but we weren't actually delivering fast enough. So we started introducing more cloud capabilities that allowed us to actually do infrastructure as code, we introduce an infrastructure as a service platform, and that actually started the DevOps movement at Ultimate Software. We got development teams that felt empowered to actually write all this automation and deliver code to production. But what started happening is that we needed even more cloud capabilities. We realized that we had reached a speed and an agility, but that speed and agility needs to improve in order to meet a customer's demands. So what we did after that is that we introduced um, an appliance framework that actually encapsulated a lot of that infrastructure as code for complex deployments such as databases and message brokers. And that improved the experience for the development teams significantly. But again, trying to meet the customer's demands because of our people first culture m m meant that some of these teams actually needed even more cloud capabilities. So, as we struggle to see how we can actually make this faster in, 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 in scaling this business, um, when we, we took a dip on the confidence. Uh, uh, I mean, as more and more developers actually needed more from this platform, and we struggled to actually give them more, more capabilities, right? Confidence started to dip, and then we looked at ourselves and said, what is it that we need to do here in order to deliver more with quality to our customers? And ensure that the development teams are empowered, to have the tools that empower them to actually deliver. So that's where we introduce Cloud Foundry into our ecosystem, or a portfolio of cloud uh, services. That significantly started helping the confidence. What we got is from early, for early, uh, early wins of actually internal tools, even some early microservices, actually start generating that adoption. And once you started getting that adoption in there and other teams started to see the capabilities of this, uh, then the confidence started growing, and we're continuing go going into that, uh, increasing that adoption and that confidence as we speak. The next journey for us is going to be what is going to be next after the Cloud Foundry application platform. So we already started to think and look at what are those other technologies that will enable us to deliver more with quality. So if we look at the forces at play here that have played out through this journey, um, it's very, very clear to us that our mission, because of our mission has been so strong, people first, simply by people's lives, and that, that has been so strong that we've always tried to meet the market demands. We've always met our customers and market demands. So that's a very strong relationship. Simplify people's lives, deliver what the customer needs, do not deliver just shiny technology objects. That has been very, very strong for us. Now, what has been also healthy but challenging is that internal reinforcement loop. I mean, this internal reinforcement loop, what, what it means is that because of our culture of empowerment, these teams, development teams, are, are encouraged and super empowered to actually innovate and deliver more. So they're constantly innovating, so they're constantly asking more from our cloud platform team for more cloud capabilities, right? So there's this internal loop that's actually constantly innovating. The challenge there is, is because we have that strong, very strong relationship between what the market demands, strong to our mission, and what we deliver to our customers. Well, there's sometimes we believe that we don't have time to focus on these cloud capabilities because we need to focus on the features of the customers, right? So even though we have these two 
very healthy relationships right there or feedback loops, it's still a little bit challenging on how do you actually weigh in what you invest in your cloud capabilities versus the features that the customers are demanding, right? So is it really a challenge, though? Is it really an opposing force, right? We believe that right now the, the really kind of the challenge is making sure that every organization is on the same page, but it's not necessarily an opposing force when you look at it. And what's happening right now is that we have these empowered teams innovating, creating more technologies, asking for more cloud capabilities, and that's actually feeding our technology strategy. That's actually helping us align the business strategy with what the technology can provide, shape that technology strategy, communicate the technology strategy, and start bringing in more cloud capabilities. And at the end of the day, what these cloud capabilities are, are improving the delivery value chain, which is essentially just giving more of these people-first features to our customers. Right? So at the end of the day, these, both of these loops are seeking the same goal, right? So our challenge today, just to recap, is that we as technologists and as people in, on Empower Teams and people working on these technology strategies, we have to actually start communicating a little bit more of how these, how these solutions actually empower the business to reach their mission critical goals and their actual cultural mission, which for us is simplify, pe simplify people's lives. Thank you.